Yep. Awesome. All right, that's great. So um, it's it, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aaron Grotus, who is my friend and colleague at Mount Sinai. Uh, Dr. Grotus completed his urology training at Beth Israel Hospital, and since then he has been um, practicing urology in Long Island and New York at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. Uh, Dr. Grotus specializes in general urology, male and female sexual dysfunction, and transgender health. And today we are very lucky to have Dr. Grotus uh, giving us a review of ED and premature ejaculation uh, and novel therapies for sexual dysfunction. Um, again, this is a very high yield topic for all board and in-service exams and the AUA core curriculum and the AUA guidelines are a great resource. I'm sure this will be a great talk. Uh, Dr. Grotus, before we get started, I was hoping you could just share with um, the residents and medical students who are tuned in here uh, a little bit about your career pathway and how you got to where you are today. Great, Alex. Thank you so much. And over the past year, it's been a pleasure to um, count Alex as a, a friend and colleague, and I look forward to working with him in the future. Um, so my dad and my brother are both urologists, so um, I knew about urology from a very young age. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the great appeals is that it's a very flexible field, and most of the people tuning in are urologists or budding urologists, so I'm not going to sell you on urology, um, but I've known about this uh, well-kept secret for a long time. And I think that um, the key um, in my career, you know, I've always kept a very open mind. Um, I trained here at uh, Beth Israel. We did some of the first robotic surgeries in Manhattan here. And I was part of that uh, experience as well as uh, a great endoscopic training uh, as well as open surgery. And I've always really kept an open mind and stayed interested in whatever. Uh, the nice thing about urology is you really can sort of pivot mid-career and do more medical management or surgical management depending on what appeals to you. Uh, in the last five years, I've um, been trained and learned how to do a lot of transgender surgery, uh, which is a very fascinating reconstructive field today. And one of my colleagues, Dr. Perot, had did a great presentation last week talking about that. And the nice thing about our environment is that we work together on a lot of cases and we're able to collaborate with world leaders. And my key advice um, for whomever is listening out there, especially the residents, if you want an experience, ask for it. If you want to learn something, go for it. Because no matter whether you're in your residency, just finished your residency, or already in attending, you are not limited in terms of what you can do. You can do plastic reconstructive pe um, procedures of the genitalia. You can collaborate with colleagues in different fields, such as radiation oncology, reconstructive surgery, and do things that you weren't necessarily trained on. So um, like our, the prior speaker this morning who gave a great talk, um, it's, the key is to communicate and to learn from each other. And one of the Twitter and Facebook groups, private Facebook groups of urologists are very good ways to collaborate with people across the country, not just in our neck of the woods. But I'm really excited about Empire Urology and this new program that Alex has helped put together with the great, um, faculty at Columbia and our colleagues at Mount Sinai, Cornell, NYU, et cetera, uh, because I think that it really can raise the camaraderie within the New York urologic community. That is great advice, Dr. Grotus. Thank you so much. And thanks for the plug for Empire. Uh, I will turn it over to you now and you can go ahead and start your presentation. If you could try to leave about five to 10 minutes at the end for questions, people will submit them in the chat and then we'll talk about them at the end. Awesome. Yeah, no, and I apologize if at any point the, um, the um, connection is a little weak, we can always try to reconnect a different way. But uh, hopefully um, the, uh, the way this hospital um, system was set up, they had no sort of um, video conferencing uh, capabilities within the different computer labs. So, um, so basically my first part of the talk is um, from the ED core curriculum of the AUA and Kelly uh, Childs um, put together a lot of these slides. We're gonna talk a lot about ED, pathophysiology, evaluation, medical and surgical management. And I know Dr. Rob Valenzuela, who's one of our champion implanters, um, we'll talk a lot about penile prosthesis and infections next week or later this week. Um, so the physiology of erections, um, there's five main, uh, four phases here, uh, flaccid, um, low flow, 
um, corporal resistance is high due to smooth muscle contraction. And usually the partial pressure of oxygen is pretty low, around 35 millimeters. The filling phase, firmness of the penis by increased arterial blood flow. Um, full erection, um, erection of the penis in a non-dependent position. And then the pressures go up to about 90. And intracavernosal okay. pressures may increase um, and penetration could be accomplished during this phase. And the rigid erection with maximal tumescence, engorgement of the corpus spongiosum as well as the cavernosum. Um, and there's contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. Um, and the pressures can even go up higher than the systolic blood pressure. So into the hundreds of uh, millimeters of mercury. Uh, so we got a lot of innervation to the penis. We got sympathetic and parasympathetic. Um, nervous system, somatic, sensory, and motor input uh, from the pelvic nerves, the parasympathetic, the hypogastric nerves, and the pudendal nerves. Um, and as you remember, symp the sympathetic chain uh, from RPL and D in terms of the ejaculate, um, retrograde ejaculation, that's a key in-service exam. So RPL and D, uh, retrograde ejaculation, sympathetic nervous system. Um, so the cavernosal nerves are the ones that actually provide corporal innervation. And it's sort of a merger of sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. The, impu the impulses travel through uh, the cavernosal nerves to affect the vascular changes. The erection is driv driven mostly by parasympathetic neurons of the pelvic ganglia. Okay, so they course into the cavernosal nerves. Uh, so we're just going to have a couple fun slides in the middle because urology is kind of a silly topic. We're going to talk about a lot about erections here. So <laughs> there might be a couple stuff in there. Um, so the pelvic ganglion is the crossroad for the general autonomic nerves, the non-cholinergic, non-andrenergic, or nitrinergic parasympathetic fibers from S2, 3, and 4, and the sympathetic nerve fibers from the thoracocolumbar sympathetic nerves, T11 through L2. Uh, so the neural pathways, the somatosensory and penile erection. So um, they form a nerve arc here. And um, the sacral spinous cord uh, via the pudendal nerve helps with the pelvic floor musculature, which helps promote uh, the enveloping muscles around the erection and helps promote rigidity. Um, it's the Erection is really the yin and yang. It's the blood flow inflow and outflow. So we want, you need to get the blood there and you need to keep it there, okay? So the corpora cavernosa, as most of you know, because you've done penile prosthesis, are these spongy areas. And it's kind of a sinusoid of blood vessel, of um, area that can fill with, with venous blood or fill with arterial blood. And, um, and it really is the sort of, parasympathetic nerve impulses that control this um, arterial and venous flow uh, to allow this to happen. So venoclusion is a key feature. Uh, and, you know, back in the day, before I was a resident, the big thing was to figure out if somebody had a venous leak. And if somebody had a venous leak, you could occlude those veins uh, surgically, and that would, be, would help with erections. And that really um, as we'll talk about with medical therapy, once PD-5 inhibitors came out, a lot of people stopped talking about venous leak. So the question is, even if venous leak is a phenomenon, if PD-5 inhibitors kind of overpower that, for most patients, maybe it's not necessary as a, as a key component. Um, so even though the penile erection is not dependent on the pelvic floor muscles or good muscle control, the, the bulbospongiosis and isocavernosal muscles um, triggered by the bulbocavernosal reflex um, really help produce a, a rigid erection, um, especially during masturbation. So, so muscle contractions increase the erectile rigidity the greatest at the time of orgasm when these muscles contract maximally. So even though you don't have to have good use of these muscles, it helps. Um, molecular control, so nitric oxide, um, the predominant mediator, penile erection, nitric oxide synthase, and neurons, and endothelium. Um, additional regulation of the phosphorylation of an activator and repression sites. Um, so they think that uh, this phosphorylation uh, gets worse when you're older, diabetic, and sick, 
at least in cellular ED models. Um, so, but it also thought that ED may contribute to these clinical states. All right, so this is our first pizza place in the presentation. This is Motorina Pizza, Motorina Pizza, and this is a, um, they brought this pizza oven over from Italy, um, piece by piece, and uh, they have an output two blocks away from Beth Israel Hospital at First Avenue and 12th Street. It's excellent pizza, Neapolitan style. Okay, molecular control of erectile function, and I'll answer more questions about pizza later. Okay, um, cyclic GMP, okay. Um, is a key promoter. Um, the net result uh, is that smooth muscle relaxation um, promotes the erection, okay? And there's re relevant factors derived from parasympathetic nerve activation um, to also increase the smooth muscle relaxation. So PDE5 in, um, is the enzyme primarily responsible for degradation of cyclic GMP in the penis. Um, and then ba basically PD5 is responsible for reducing TMSense by opposing the nitric oxide pathway. Selective inhibitors are the mainstay of modern erectogenic therapies. So what does ED really mean? So there's really two main classifications, organic, physical defects. So you have a vascular phenomenon, neurogenic, hormonal, cavernosal. Um, I had a patient just recently who had a massive um, pelvic trauma after um, after being uh, sitting on his motorcycle, uh, was waiting at a stoplight, and somebody railroaded him, and he has pretty bad blood flow to his penis now and decreased sensation, uh, which is slowly getting better. Uh, thankfully, he had no urethral trauma, but I can't imagine how. God willing, he's okay. Psychogenic ED. Um, so factors: anxiety, guilt, lack of confidence, depression, and conflict about sexual issues. I want to talk about guilt for a second. So we see a lot of men who've had multiple rounds of STI screenings, and they're still convinced that they have something. Guilt phenomenon is a real thing in clinical practice. You have to be able, as the urologist, to be able to talk to patients about what they've done and how to move on. And my best advice is not to be preachy to them and not to be too judgy, but say to them, if you're upset about what happened and you're really worried that you got your partner sick because you cheated on them what, or what have you, then maybe that's not something you want to do again. And then if they persist about it, then you refer them to one of the vast array now of psychologists, psychotherapists. And the nice thing is that everybody's doing telemedicine now. So you can get people in to see people without them having to go there. Sauce Pizzeria, right next to Motorino, also excellent pizza right here in downtown Manhattan. These guys totally, during COVID, totally changed their whole business model, and they're providing thousands of pizza pies a day to first responders. So kudos to Sauce Pizza, excellent slice. All right, primary etiology is organic ED. So mostly vascular, diabetic, and then medication-induced. So if you think about it, we talked about pelvic surgery radiation. That's only 6% of organic ED, mostly vascular and diabetic. So uh, patients who, have, um, who are not taking care of themselves, who have blood sugar disorders, as well as maybe metabolic syndrome, are a majority of the patients who need our help. Those are the ones that are coming into the clinic besides um, surgery and other medications. Um, so medications, so 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, anti-androgens, um, so spironolactone is a big one. Uh, we see that in the transgender community because they're trying to suppress the T in trans females. Um, ACE inhibitors, so ACE has been a big discussion with COVID and whether sperm and whether the testicles are involved because um, with ACE inhibitors, um, Maybe those people are less likely to get COVID, and maybe that's why women who make less ACE um, are, um, are having less COVID, because the ACE um, receptors ACE are, are helping the COVID get into sperm. So it turns out COVID probably does get expressed in sperm. So psychiatric medicines make sense because they blur responses to things. So they really do sometimes kill erections. On the other hand, they also cause priapism. So you really gotta make sure which specific medication you're talking about. And we'll talk about SSRIs a little bit later in the talk when we talk about PE. Um, evaluation. 
So it's often the urologist or the doctor has to initiate the conversation about sexual wellness because of embarrassment or difficulty. And I think that, you know, in the limited time, sometimes we have with patients, it's very important to talk about it early. Uh, if that's a focus of what the patient wants to talk about, if they're not there for cancer or hematuria or something like that, because when you run your practice, if you always have the patient after you've fully examined them, fully had a full discussion and you're about to put them on Flomax or what have you, then they say, oh, by the way, I also have ED. You might change your treatment paradigm. So it's best to screen for ED and talk about it early if that's something you want to focus your visit on or you want to help patients with. Um, reversible vascular health issues. So smoking cessation, increased physical activity, dietary modification. A great documentary on Netflix called Game Changers talks about vegetarian diet. And uh, there's urologists featured in this talking about some studies of penile tumescence and, um, and better penile tumescence, even with a few days of a vegetarian or vegan diet. Uh, so it could be what we're putting into our bodies and how we're treating ourselves that cause our dysfunction. Uh, ED history. So we really got to gather all the elements that you can read here. Uh, loss of sustaining. So a lot of men, you really got a chicken or egg. Is this PE? Is this ED? And you really have to take a good history to figure this out. And a lot of times patients, I'll stop them after listening to what they've said and, and try to really nail down. Do you have trouble getting an erection? Do you have trouble keeping an erection? Do you ejaculate too quickly? And even those three main questions, besides all the other scores and the other paradigms, because I think those are some of the keys to focus in on. This is Lucali. Lucali is an excellent pizza place in Brooklyn. You can now call and pick up from there, which you could never do before. I was only eating in the restaurant. Excellent pizza place. Um, physical exam. So heavy men, increased BMI, breast swelling, secondary sex characteristics, signs of T deficiency syndrome. So poor beard, low pu sort of not fully developed pubic hair, um, penile examination. So length, skin lesions, hypospadias, palpation. Um, and feeling for penile plaques and Peyronie's disease, scrotal, so testicle size, consistency, location, uh, prostate exams in appropriate men, bulbal cavernosa reflex evaluations, um, but this can be absent up to 30% of normal. There's even a uh, company that makes a machine to do BCR testing, which is a pretty nifty little machine. It was made by a nurse, um, but um, the data is a little uh, iffy whether that's really that useful. Uh, penile Doppler ultrasound, so su used to be super popular, especially before Viagra. Um, uh, so there's two sort of camps. So a lot of implanters do penile Doppler ultrasound, sort of, so they evaluate before vasoactive agents and then add the vasoactive agents. Failure to receive a good erection during this lowers the accuracy of the test. So uh, Dr. Stember, one of my colleagues, talks about, especially young men getting this test, their adrenaline levels go super up, and they, the adrenaline and their sort of, sort of fear and anxiety about it, even with very high doses of Trimex or um, Caverject or Edex, may not achieve a good erection. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're impotent or they have an um, inability to always get an erection, but they could have a very high adrenaline level due to anxiety um, and situational anxiety. So these are the key measures. Um, and part of the science with the Doppler is really to figure out the, um, the correct dosing. So you start with a pretty low dose of a vasoactive agent, and then you titrate up. And the idea is you want to figure out, one, is that is there a venous leak? How do they respond? But also, if they're going to do injections afterwards, getting on optimal dose so they don't take too much, they don't have side effects such as priapism uh, from their um, injections moving forward. Um, so 30 centimeters per second or lower of peak systolic velocity is considered arterial insufficiency. Um, and diastolic volume of greater than five consistent with venous leak. Uh, so the, peak, the peaks are low, that means they're not getting enough blood flow in, and if the 
values are high, that means they're, they're leaking out all this stuff. So resist, resistive index is an equation here, and RI values greater than 0 0.8, normal, okay? Dally's Pizza in New Haven, also an amazing place. Um, check out, it's, you know, good to see. This just shows like a regular um, Doppler ultrasound um, of the penile arteries, and a lot of, um, the key with ultrasound, just like Dr. Eschke gave a talk um, um, two weeks ago, or approximately, the key with ultrasound is practice. And you've got to, um, every machine is a little different. There's nuances, and you got to just get comfortable with them. So with venous leak here, um, so the resistive index is a little lower, 0 0.78, and the uh, valleys are a little high, OK? process care model here for ED, so identify them, educate the patient and the partner, reversible causes, meds, endocrinopathy, poor diet, first line therapies are counseling or PD-5 inhibitors. Then we're talking about injections, suppositories, vacuum erection device, and surgery. Um, so you want to, you really want to talk to these, some of these the guys that are 40 years old, 50 years old, have never seen a cardiologist, have never had screening uh, for for their heart. And they turns out they have a family history or high cholesterol. And you find this stuff, you can save their lives. You tell someone to stop smoking, you can save their lives. A medication adjustment. Sometimes the antihypertensives that keep their blood pressure down are keeping the blood pressure or the flow to their penis down. So beta blockers and thiazide diuretics are key offenders. And then you got to look for antiandrogens, antidepressants, and psychotropic. Over-the-counter stuff. None of this stuff really works too well. Um, and the data is variable. There's no good evidence-based evidence -based medicine for this, right? Uh, so the problem with the gas station pills that men are getting is that a lot of them will have their over-the-counter supplements are not regulated. Some of them will have sildenafil or active ingredient like Viagra in them, and then they sort of swap it out uh, so that it's not it's under the radar. So patients will say they work. Sometimes they have yohimbine, which is pretty dangerous for the heart, or some type of caffeine. And caffeine will sort of get somebody amped up and they'll feel like, oh, this must have worked, but it's much more likely the placebo effect. Um, Don's Pizzeria just reopened during uh, COVID. Excellent. All right. Um, PD5 inhibitors. Um, I think the key here um, is the serum half life of Tadalafil. And I think that uh, besides uh, Sildenafil or Viagra, um, some people like the um, early onset of Ardenafil and a couple other agents, uh, but they're pretty equivalent. Uh, the key also to realize is Tadalafil also has an indication for BPH of Cialis for daily use. Uh, and for some of your men, that may be pretty useful. Um, unlike the, um, we'll talk about retrograde ejaculation la later, but Cialis is one of the BPH agents that does not have a side effect of, uh, of uh, an ejaculation or retrograde ejaculation. Um, so PD-5 inhibitors, um, so basically these drugs were um, initially uh, marked, uh, studied for pulmonary hypertension. They showed that they did have an erectogenic effect. Um, the first time prescription uh, efficacy is 60 to 75%. Um, so there's, you know, I really tell patients that like Coke and Pepsi, it's their personal preference. There's some economic concerns. Now that most of them are generic, uh, the economic concerns have gotten less. Um, right. So Viagra failures or, or PD-5 inhibitor failures, I think really a good history is important. Um, you wanna make sure the patient tried a max dose at least four times before saying we're, they're a failure. Up to 50% of patients will um, respond, even though they were a failure, if they were re-educated by a professional. Got to remember, we're the experts. So patients who got it from a doctor or a friend, but not necessarily a urologist, may not have been given proper instructions. They have a lot of other stuff to worry about, these other providers, when they're helping take care of patients. Okay. so. Uh, so after nerve injury, um, patients don't always do well with PD-5 inhibitors. 
There's also evidence that men with testosterone deficiency may have an altered response to PD-5 inhibitors. Uh, five years ago, they were supplementing a lot of men in the United States without even checking testosterone levels. Um, but testosterone, a serum testosterone level, morning testosterone level under 300 or under, an, under your lab's normal value is an independent risk factor for failing Viagra or failing PD-5 inhibitors. So androgen supplementation may help salvage some of these failures before moving on. Um, I tell patients six to eight weeks on androgens before feeling uh, different sexually in terms of libido and sexual function. It's a conservative estimate, but I think it's fair to counsel patients because some of them are thinking they're going to take one shot of IM testosterone and perform better in the bedroom, and it's better to set expectations uh, at a realistic level. Uh, only strong contraindication, um, concurrent nitrates medication, sublingual isosorbidinitrate, um, which a lot of people are not on anymore, um, but it's good to screen them and patients will try to connive you and say that they're not on them that often. And I make those patients go back to their cardiologist and uh, formally tell me that they're off them before I feel comfortable prescribing for them. Um, Patients on a stable alpha blocker therapy are advised to commence PD-5 inhibitors at one quarter of the maximum dose. I know this is recommended. I'd say that a lot of urologists don't really practice that. Um, alpha blockers and PD-5 inhibitors, four hours apart from one another, um, which can be problematic because a lot of men are on alpha blockers at night and a lot of sexual activity occurs at night. Uh, so there's no reason why the alpha blockers can't be taken earlier in the day. Um, Vardenafil has been associated with congenital QT syndrome, not recommended with that. Uh, and antiarrhythmics and Vardenafil are contraindicated because those uh, exacerbate that QT interval. Um, so this is a cytochrome that uh, associated PD-5 inhibitors, uh, and they worry about antifungals, protease inhibitors, macrolides, um, clinical, that may or may not be clinically significant. Uh, we've got to worry about renal insufficiency, hepatic insufficiency as well. Um, major side effects, headache, facial flushing, and then back pain is a key one uh, with Tadalafil because of the cross-reactivity of PD-11, which is expressed in the back. Um, but pretty much, uh, you know, they're, they're all kind of vasoactive uh, agents, so headache and facial flushing are pretty common. Also, visual disturbances much more common with sildenafil than, than some of the other agents. Uh, and then we're going to talk about other devices, um, which is a vacuum erection device. So let's go back to that one sec. And uh, I don't know if you guys remember Austin Powers, but he got caught with the Swedish penis enlarger, and he said, it's not as bad, baby. So devices create a vacuum around the flaccid penis, causes dilation, cavernous spaces, drawing venous pressure into the blood. Um, and I think that, you know, so what are the main side effects? Hematoma formation, overpressurized, ecchymosis, skin necrosis. Um, I think the key counseling is that patients get a constrictive band that they know how to take off and they can take off even when they're erect. Uh, patients use other types of metal rings that are very hard to take off when the penis is erect, um, cause a lot of emergency room visits and cause uh, the urologist have to call in the fire department or other sort of first responders to help them remove these mechanical devices from patients. So um, tightness of the ring, disruption of ejaculation can lead to pain, hematoma, hematuria, and distress, and fertility problem. Very penis may cause it very hard to use a vacuum erection device in morbidly obese patients. Uh, patients with poor dexterity, um, uh, they may benefit from an electronic or a battery-operated pump instead. Uh, some type of Peyronie's disease may cause it hard to use. Um, just another thing with our transgender patients, our uh, female to male patients, um, sometimes we'll recommend that they pump. Um, you can make small pumps um, using a syringe as well as uh, some surgical tubing. Um, I can send you guys some slides. If anyone can tweet me about that if they want to learn more about that. But um, vacuum erection devices used to be um, covered by Medicare, and they used to they used to be charged very expensive over the counter, and now they're mostly over the counter and not covered by Medicare. Um, views. So this is a prostaglandin E1, 
intraurethrally. Um, so the, the Uh, looks like we lost Dr. Grotis for a second. I'm sure he will be right back. I'm just going to give him a quick call. Just bear with us. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Groves is just getting back online. Just give us a quick minute here while we deal with this technical issue. Thanks so much. Hey, Dr. Grotis, I see you are back in. Wi-Fi probably. Sorry, yeah, I don't know. It, it kind of timed out on the Wi-Fi. We can get right back into it. No worries. Thanks so much. Sorry about that. Hold on. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so contraindications, hypersensitivity to PG1, sickle cell trait, thrombocytopenia, should use, we use cautiously. And um, so they're concerned about some prostaglandin transmission during, with pregnant women because of uh, induction of labor. Intracavernosal injections are pretty popular. Um, basically a combination of vasoactive agents. Um, there's sort of two commercially available, which are Caverject and, e and EDEX, um, which are pro all are Prostadil, and then they use P prostaglandin, papaver, and pentolamine. That's Trimex. Um, so Trimex is supposedly less painful than the Caverject or EDEX, and we use a tiny needle. So these are insulin syringes, basically 29 to 31 gauge. The, so the needle itself doesn't cause discomfort. So alprostadil uh, is what's approved for monotherapy. The other stuff uh, widely used, not FDA approved. Um, so papaverin is a nonspecific PDE, PDE inhibitor, so increases CMP and CGMP. Uh, so there's no standard formulations. And um, I think the key is to really communicate with your colleagues if you're starting an injection program so that you use sort of conventional therapies and you do stuff at like a safe level. Um, because of, uh, just like anything else, if you don't know the proper dosing, you don't look it up properly. Um, you, these are not on the shelf medications, so you could really kind of overdose someone pretty easily by uh, the click of a mouse when you're ordering this stuff. So it's one benefit of the electronic medical records, certain um, combinations will be rejected. Um, however, since these are usually, these are compounded, you gotta be very careful. There's no standard formulation. Uh, so doing a test dose, so that's often done with the Doppler. Um, and now with uh, the advent of coverage of video visits, some of uh, our doctors are having um, the nurses or the doctors themselves do telemedicine visits, um, patients to do injections in the privacy of their own home. And I think that's a real benefit for 
uh, telemedicine because a lot of men uh, may be interested in adopting uh, this technology, but not necessarily that psyched about doing it in the office uh, where there's both men and women there and, and just other people. Uh, so if they get pain or um, bother, they should pick an alternate site, no more than once in 24 hours and no more than three days a week uh, to decrease the likelihood of priapism and fibrotic reaction. Main side effect, penile pain, um, cavernous neuropathy, both radical prostate and diabetics tend to have the greatest sensitivity to prostaglandin uh, and uh, they don't do well necessarily in cavernous edX. A 3% get nodularity about 18 months. And you can get a hematoma, dizziness, um, about 4% priapism. Um, so if patients are not willing to do it or they're not sort of happy doing it, then you shouldn't give it to them. That makes a lot of sense. Peronises, you gotta be very careful. Uh, if they form the plaque already, it may be hard for them. If they may form another one, they may get more scarring. It may be harder to do surgery on them in the future. Um, patient with short or buried penis, uh, MAOI inhibitors because of the adrenergic uh, response. Um, so you gotta be very careful because you wanna use phenylephrine and, and epinephrine to reverse these erections. So you gotta be careful in patients who are MAOI inhibitors. Um, and uh, you gotta be careful patients on um, anticoagulants because of bruising and hematoma. So even though it's a tiny needle, they gotta hold pressure and be careful. Penile implant, um, very good for patients who have failed uh, non-surgical management, can't tolerate the surgical management, or they just don't wanna do take pills for the rest of their life. There's the non-inflatable or the malleable implant. The amp, this is an ambicarse, a two-piece IPP. This is a three-piece. This is a refamp encoded um, Boston Scientific AMS, uh, the other company's Coloplast. Um, Coloplast, instead of having the refamp encoding on it, um, has the ability to really absorb during the time right before implant or absorb that antibiotic. So it sort of offers a similar protection, though it's not impregnated on it in advance. Uh, Dr. Valenswell is going to talk about this all about this next week, but one to five percent, and uh, usually within the first eight weeks is when people present. Occasionally, it's a later time that they broad spectrum antibiotics make a lot of sense. Um, so what else can happen? Urethral injury, corporal perforation, bladder injury, dry ice erosion. So that's really the ED stuff. Just take a deep breath and uh, we're talking about PE for a second. Um, so PE is really male sexual dysfunction characterized by ejaculation occurs prior within about a, within the first minute. And they really only talk about heterosexual vaginal intercourse sex in this definition, about one minute at, or often at about, um, or clinically bothersome in a latency time, often about three minutes or less. Um, so first, so there's the uh, lifelong PE. So it happened every single time they had a sexual encounter um, and then acquired PE where they were doing okay, uh, but they, they lose their erection too quickly. The risk factors, depression, psychological, personal difficulties, hypersensitivity to the glands, robust uh, cortical representation of the pudendal nerve, <coughs> serotonic, serotonergic neurotransmission, and then prostatitis, metabolic syndrome, physical inactivity, detox from prescribed medication, drugs, chronic pelvic, pelvic pain syndrome, and thyroid disorders. So PE, a little less common than ED, probably about 4%, although a situational um, PE will about 30 to 60% of men um, will have early ejaculation or other ejaculatory dysfunction at some point in their lives. Um, so it may be underreported as well. Uh, so do they also have ED? It's also, it's really recommended that you address the ED first because if there's no rigid erection, the sexual satisfaction may be less and it may sort of solve the problem. Um, primary PE the real recommendation is to treat with psychosexual counseling and then medical therapy, so SSRIs and topical treatments. Uh, and secondary PE, we're also talking about medication situational and address the underlying concerns. So just like ED, 
we're addressing the underlying concerns and talking to patients about what's going on in their lives. It's a key to represent um, a mainstay in therapy. And as the urologist, we may be the only patient, only person that they confide in and talk to about this stuff. So it's really important uh, to represent um, the medical community and make sure the patients get to the right place. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that's off label for treating premature ejaculation in, in males. Um, psychotherapy, SSRIs, Paxil, Zoloft, um, et cetera, tricyclic antidepressants, clomipramine, specifically dipoxetine, also uh, not currently available in the United States, local anesthetics, so lidocaine gel, benzocaine, um, et cetera, tramadol, uh, because it has some opioid properties, uh, can inhibit the sexual response a little bit so that the uh, PE gets better. A combination of drugs and psychotherapy and physical or behavioral therapy, especially in those patients who have pelvic floor disorders, um, et cetera. Um, psychosexual factors. Um, so partner, relationship, um, sexual satisfaction, contextual. And I think this is a good time uh, just briefly to touch on um, like PTSD stuff as well as abuse. Um, in our clinic, we do sort of screen patients for abuse and anyone sort of taking advantage of them. And while it's not our goal to sort of solve all their problems, it's good to identify patients who are there who um, are disenfranchised or don't have another voice. Uh, so just keep that in mind when someone's uh, presenting with sexual dysfunction. It could be a larger psychosexual or psychological problem due to trauma, et cetera. Uh, later, absent orgasm. Um, it's usually about 20 to 30 minutes for exhaustion by the patient or their partner and uh, in, with other, without other underlying disorders. Um, risk factors include SSRIs. You use SSRIs to treat the PE, but it causes delayed ejaculation. So sometimes it does exactly what you want it to do, but it works too well. Um, increasing age, ED, diabetes, depression, LUTs, low T, penile sensor loss. It's so interesting. So low T can cause delayed ejaculation and ED. So a lot of these things, they kind of bucket in. Maybe we don't really understand what's causing it. Um, suppression of the normal CNS arousal system, which triggers the sexual climax. Uh, so antidepressants, other CNS drugs, alcohol, antipsychotics, opioids, all matter. Strokes associated with impairment of orga orgasm response hypothyroidism, testosterone deficiency, potential ideology, ideology as well. So they think that alpha blockers appear to lead to ejaculatory dysfunction or retrograde ejaculation by suppression of emission. Um, so more of an anejaculatory response. Decline ejaculate volume also with 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, uh, although the mechanism of action is not so clear. Psychological variables include stress, conflict with a partner, trauma, et cetera. Um, so there's also some evidence that association with reliance on intensive penile stimulation during masturbation, and then uh, there's um, an imbalance during sexual intercourse with a partner where the masturbatory style doesn't match the intercourse style, and then there's an inability to find pleasure. and um, I think that a lot of our patients are much more creative in terms of finding sexual outlets and um, toys and what have you to sort of enhance their sexual response. And I think in 2020, all the stuff is available to people. So it's not necessarily something where the urologist has to do that for them or provide those sort of aids for them, but they can just sort of say, hey, you know, maybe that's something you want to think about as long as it's safe, something that you can remove if you need to, et cetera. So they think about four, oh, about 14% of men have, uh, between 40 and 80 have reported difficulty achieving orgasm, and that's not including ED. Um, so SSRI agents, testosterone deficiency uh, with delayed ejaculation or orgasmic disorder. So this is not an ejaculation, but delayed ejaculation. So carbegiline or bupropion are two of the things that have been studied uh, for orgasmic disorders in men. Um, and there's some case reports about intranasal oxytocin as well, and a couple other drugs can enhance the orgasmic response. 
Um, but there's not that much evidence. Penile vibratory stimulation can also be useful for men with absent or delayed orgasm. Uh, so basically, you've got to check the T, you can check their penile sensation, and you want to determine hypogonadism, sensory loss, offending medications, et cetera. Uh, so just, I have just a couple more minutes. I just wanted to say something about, uh, it's a talk I gave at Mount Sinai Grand Rounds. Uh, there's a lot of people out there doing what we do well, and they're doing it poorly. Uh, we're really good about giving coupons, giving, um, helping patients get their medicine, treating PE, giving people ED stuff, giving testosterone, and putting prosthesis in. But we, a lot of our patients and potential patients are going to Rome and our HIMSS. Um, they're going to Ageless Male, Bioidentical Hormone Centers, Boston Medical Group, for example. I'm not picking on any particular brand. Um, but I think urologists' role in sexual health is to advocate for our patients, to be a voice of reason. Uh, these direct marketing techniques are attracting interest. And telemedicine, and I, I said this months ago, poses risks and opportunity for urologists. And part of the main thing that will be limited is our state licensing. Um, so promescence and over-the-counter spray, these, there are benzocaine wipes, um, some good randomized trials, clomipramine, um, 15 milligrams PO, two to six hours prior to sex, uh, Paxil and Zoloft and therapy. Um, so in Korea, they do a lot of neurolysis of the penile nerves. Uh, and uh, they report that, you know, the patients were satisfied afterwards, 143 patients, 81% satisfied. Um, so what are they doing here? Uh, they're separating some of, not the sort of deep dorsal penile vein or the, um, the main nerves, but really just sort of cutting off several branches. Um, so they do uh, some fillers, hyaluronic acid and, um, and other fillers. Uh, you can get numbness, paresthesias, neuromas. Uh, this really isn't advocated in the United States, but there's certainly patients getting fillers and injections into their penis in the United States. So this is the Korean approach um, where they basically go around the glands and inject um, filler, um, hyaluronic acid filler into the glands penis. Uh, this is a different technique that's used. Um, this is a glands penis uh, augmentation to decrease sensation by putting an alloderm or collagen scaffold graft underneath, um, just underneath um, at the coronal sulcus there. Uh, shockwave for ED is just something else that's being done around the country. People are putting up billboards all over the, fact, all over the place. Uh, so this is a low intensity shockwave or acoustic energy effect. Um, and they think that it may recruit stem cells and increase angiogenesis. And the RAT studies showed improved smooth muscle collagen ratios and upregulation growth factors. And this is not the Viagra pathway. It's not the nitric oxide pathway. Um, so that's an interesting thing. And that's sort of being done at academic centers on trial and um, being offered to patients. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which is really good for radiation cystitis, has been and non-healing wounds done off label for erectile dysfunction. There's some small studies out of Israel as well as some other countries. It may work. Um, uh, so this is just a study about hyperbaric oxygen. They showed they got some good results. Uh, but hyperbaric oxygen, you got to do 30-minute sessions, um, 40 sessions, and you know, it's a lot. It's a lot of work for the patient. Um, so this just talks about. We shockwave kidney stones, so we go up at, at about 500 bar of shockwave pressure and under 80 bar for ED. Uh, and some of the machines that we're using uh, were done in orthopedics, and they have some FDA approvals for orthopedics, and they're off-label use for these machines um, for this. So there's two different ways. One's an air compressed system. It's like hearing a bullet in a barrel, and the other is electromagnetic. Uh, there's uh, magnetic fields that are causing the bolts to strike. So it's basically the same kind of shockwave pressure, uh, but um, it's driving in a different way. And um, it's just the, either the magnet or the compressed air that are causing the strike of this bullet into the ball to get the acoustic wave out. So 2010 was the first study in European urology, um, middle-aged men, and half of them were Viagra failures. And the meta-analysis showing a bunch of different studies showing some efficacy 
um, for this, all using um, validated questionnaires. Not a FDA approved for this. There's no reimbursement from insurance. Um, the societies say this should be investigational and should, that should be disclosed to the patients. Um, and patients should sign if they're paying for it that uh, it's a non covered treatment. And they should always, you know, the bottom line is the shockwave is not that risky. So medical doctors feel very cavalier or other clinics feel cavalier about offering it to patients. And it's probably much less risky than starting a patient on hormone therapy that's unnecessary, like a testosterone therapy, or even giving people vasoactive agents like Viagra or Cialis. Um, but I think it's important that we know about this stuff so that we can talk to patients about it. Because a lot of our patients, especially in major metropolitan areas like New York, are doing this stuff at clinics that have nothing to do with urologists. Um, multiple factors in amniotic fluid are being offered to patient. It may be safe. There's some preliminary, preliminary data. Does it work? The jury's still out. The Sexual Medicine Society says this should not be marketed. It should not be performed unless it's done under trial. Um, given a lack of the regulatory uh, agency approval um, for ED and such, the Sexual Medicine Society does not believe that shockwave or stem shells or PRP should be used the bottom line is that things like PRP, which are the patient's own blood and shockwave, are probably less risky than giving um, a, uh, another, another patient's or amniotic fluid or whatever's been washed out um, in a sort of a higher risk environment. Um, there have been some preliminary studies, uh, and there's some grants out there and some papers about PTNS um, for sexual dysfunction. Uh, tibial nerves uh, under, behind the medial malleolus of the ankle. It's a 30 gauge acupuncture needle and the electrical stimulation is a level of um, about 30 minutes. So female patients have reported some improved sexual function with this. Um, and in my practice, patients, female patients with OAB have said that their, their sex lives, their clitoral stimulation did improve. Um, but there's no really good placebo or sham controlled studies, which I think would really be necessary uh, to market this to patients and really say that this is something that's useful. Um, there have been a couple of studies. One was in the Netherlands. Um, and the question is, why aren't more people studying this? And I think that they're, they're starting to. Um, and uh, they're small companies, and the reimbursement's just not there. This is how it, um, it worked on the um, dental and, and bladder efferent fibers uh, by stimulating the tibial nerve. Um, and this is a new machine that's coming out called the eCoin, um, which is going to sit on the tibial um, uh, behind the medial malleolus and provide stimulation. And who knows, maybe that'll also work for female sexual function. And there's a bunch of other slides talking about medical marijuana and how we use it for pelvic pain and stuff like that. Uh, but I think we're going to wrap it up right there. It's 854. Now I can answer any questions before I have to go to the OR. Thank you so much, Dr. Grotis. Really great talk, very high yield. We covered lots and lots of uh, points in there that come up on the boards and the in-service uh, time and time again. So uh, great resource. And we will be posting a recording of the lecture on our um, website and uh, exciting announcement on our new YouTube page. Uh, we have converted all the recording over to YouTube. Huge thanks to Dr. Uh, Akil Saji, who's a, a resident over at New York Medical College, who switched over all the recordings manually for us. So that's awesome. And then uh, one more thing that I forgot to mention, uh, Dr. Grotis, big thanks to you for designing the Empire Urology logo that is uh, featured on our uh, Zoom page here and our website. So thanks for chipping in with that too. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that came up in the chat here. Um, Dr. Maher asks, how do you manage headaches uh, for patients on PDE-5s? So that's a great question. I think that, um, I think the first thing is that patients should be well hydrated when they take PD-5 inhibitors. And I think that a lot of patients will just go for the highest dose or the doctors will prescribe them 100 milligrams of sildenafil, um, 20 milligrams of tadalafil. The nice thing is that now that these are generic and we can get 20 milligram, 25 milligram, and 50 milligram pills of sildenafil, we can really play around with the doses so you get just enough. And I'd say at least half of the headaches or flushing uh, the patients are getting, and they're probably just being a little bit overdosed. And I think part of it is also a great opportunity to talk to the patients about lifestyle, talk about what other factors they can improve in their lives 
to enhance her sexual function without side effects. Um, in the future, I think that shockwave is here to stay and it may actually prove to be beneficial. And the big appeal of things like shockwave and PRP to patients is that they're not um, permanent drug therapies. Uh, I'm not officially endorsing them or saying that you should use them for your patients right now. However, I do think that potentially um, they may be ways to increase um, function without, uh, without having as much uh, pharmacotherapy. But I think also, you know, it could even just be that, you know, these medicines are like Coke and Pepsi. Different medicines work well and appeal to different patients. Just because I like pizza doesn't mean you have to, Alex, but I know you're a big pizza fan as well. <laughs> but I do. <laughs> uh, perfect uh, segue to the next question uh, from Dr. Maher. Uh, what do you think about pineapples on pizza? <laughs> oh, I, I, can we mute that doctor from now on? So, <laughs> you know, I'm cool with whatever you want to put on your pizza, but uh, the classic, when you try a piece, play, pizza place and evaluate it, you should try their plain slice and really just like when we're talking about data and we're talking about how to compare studies, right? We want to use evidence-based medicine. So when I go to a pizza place, I get their regular slice with nothing on it, and that's what I compare. And if any of you guys are big pizza fans and don't know about Dave Portnoy and the One Bite app and his YouTube channel, check it out. Because not only in New York, but in, the, in Florida, he reviews a lot of pizza places up. Uh, but basically, this guy who's a big... Um, media mogul in, um, in sports, um, he works in New York and he goes to at least one pizza pace a day and reviews them. And now he's doing frozen pizzas during COVID, which is pretty fascinating. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, time for one more question. Last question here is, um, are you using vacuum erectile, uh, erection devices or ICI for penile rehab post RP in patients who uh, fail PDE5? That's a great question. I think that vacuum erection devices really do have a role. Um, I think that um, intracavernosal injections are very helpful for achieving good erections afterwards. Um, I think that in the next year or two, we'll probably have some good studies on shockwave for penile rehab as well. Um, I think a lot of the patients is, is that it takes time for patients to recover from nerve injury. And if they had a thermal or nerve injury, but didn't have a complete injury, uh, it's going to take six months to a year to recover. So anything you do to optimize it during that time, if they get no response from Viagra, I think a low-dose intracavernosal injection, my colleague, Dr. Stember, is really doing that sort of on a, a more regular basis now. And uh, I think vacuum devices have a role. The question is, is that if they're done improperly, the vacuum device and the constrictive device can cause problems. So... You gotta be careful. You know, you're trading one thing for another. You start injecting the penis, you cause Peyronie's disease, you cause pain. Uh, and when a patient can achieve intercourse, and then they're gonna not wanna do that moving forward when they're actually able to have sex again, or they wanna have sex again. So then you've sort of pushed them into getting a penile prosthesis, which I think a penile prosthesis is a great thing after radical prostatectomy. It should be offered to patients maybe even you know, you know, six months later or three months later, it's certainly a possibility. However, I think that you don't want to burn any bridges. So during the time when they're not really going to be sexually active, you start injecting the penis and a patient gets turned off from it. And then they, they'll not have that in their armamentarium later. So it's always good to discuss this with people, people who are comfortable with needles, they know what to do. That might be a good option. 